off. <laughs> All right, so uh, hello, I'm Helen. I'm Helen Lee. Um, I am a hardware hacker and general purpose weirdo. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, music tech that uses hardware um, and um, some cool sound hacking from the um, music tech communities in London and Berlin, both of which I've been active in. Um, I'm also going to take you on a bit more of an in-depth tour of one of my favorite open source hardware technologies for making embedded instruments. Um, and um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, how artists and educators are using embedded systems and physical computing in their work and how the ideas and practicality of open source fits in with them. Okay. But before I start all of that juiciness, I am going to tell you who I am, because uh, none of you will have heard of me. So, onward. How, how do I click on this thing? Do I just where's the, is there a, a clicker? Do I just press space? Let's just press space. Well done, Helen. All right. <laughs> so um, let me introduce myself. Um, I um, don't have a job. I haven't had a job in ten years, which is um, which is a success, in, as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> um, I make lots of strange technologies, and um, I do um, a lot of what falls underneath the broad spectrum of creative technology, now, which is really just a buzzword that I say because people can will understand basically. Um, what I like to do. And what I like to do is I am a massive nerd, um, but I am also um, really into like art and music. So I like to smush the two things together as much as possible, like make them kiss. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it's a disaster, but um, there we are, that's life. Um, so my main piece of the main my main genre of art that I work in is uh, music and sound nonsense, and my main area of nerdiness, um, f which is is is, uh, is physical computing and electronics and hardware that kind of stuff. Um, so what this is uh, this is an example of one of the weird pieces of music technology I've made. We'll listen to it later. This is um, one of my creatures. I have a series of creatures. Um, that I make. I've actually just returned from a two-month art and tech residency in um, Copenhagen, where I've been making some even weirder new things with these. Um, I'll tell you about those later. But just as an example, I make like stuff. Um, this is this is all using um, actually this this is using um, embedded um, Linux computers to run this, which I'll I'll show you like later. Um, I also do some product design, primarily around education technology. This is my hand. I am a hand model as well, only one time. <laughs> but it was a very exciting thing to put on my CV. This is a product I designed for the musician um, Imogen Heap and the company P. Maroney. Um, I was the lead developer on that. And I guess if you were being kind, you could call it an embedded systems wearable device. Um, if you weren't, you'd say it's a, it's a micro bit and a bit of felt. Um, but it's a learning device more than anything else. It is a, um, a $33 piece of equipment that gets kids making, wiring, and coding their own um, DIY instrument. It um, uses very simple sensing, uh, accelerometer, magnetometer, um, and you know some basic sound. Um, that is, in fact, the, the, the world's first sewable speaker. Uh, so, <laughs> commercially available sewable speaker, um, which we were marginally proud of. Um, anyway, next. Oh, yes, another thing I do, I do a lot of writing. I write for Hackaday, um, I write for Hackspace magazine, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a still from my first book in my own name. I have written lots of books, but this is the first one in my own name. It was a book on electronics um, through DIY craft. So, um, I, I worked with a group of 200 girls um, who were my advisory board. It was adorable. Um, and we help, We made this book together. So it's a, it's a book that teaches the basic concepts of analog electronics, no code, no wiring, um, but through, um, through embroidery. So we do circuit, em circuit embroidery, paper crafting, blah, 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 you know. Um, it's real cute. Um, and probably not relevant for any of you, <laughs> but it's cute anyway. That's my favorite emoji, it's the sparkle heart. Don't at me. Um, I also, in terms of my writing, actually one of the main things I do for money, because art doesn't pay the bills, is curriculum design. So I will do that at a very high level. For example, uh, last year I designed the first 
um, physical computing um, curriculum for the country of Oman. Um, and I've also written curriculum for National Geographic and Intel Education and so on. Um, it's typically, um, I plan out ways to get children excited about computing in a way that isn't just kind of paper-based programming. Um, I have lots of opinions about that, um, but uh, now is not time for that. Um, I also did a m uh, my first MA module um, recently, that was pretty cool, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So I designed and taught a module on a master's course on music technologies, the title of which was How Hacking and Making Has Influenced Music Technologies. And it was actually a, a technology module taught to musicians who'd never had, like I, I got them to make their first circuit and write their first line of code. Um, and they had to invent an instrument, an, an embedded systems instrument by the end of the module, um, which was really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, maybe here, actually. So this is me doing some teaching, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so mostly what I teach, um, I teach um, technical people how to be creative, or I teach creative people, creative people, um, how to be um, technical. You know, so I will teach um, established artists and designers um, you know, what code is and why it's actually not scary, um, or, you know, how to make circuits and how to integrate that into their own work. I don't believe that you should go to an artist and expect them to learn um, enormous amounts of um, technical knowledge. What you need to be able to do is teach them the little bits of things in, that they need to know in order um, to make their work better. Because their work isn't to become a pre computer programmer, their work is to you know, to be able to use um, technology as a tool in their own work in a way that's appropriate for them. And the same way, the same way goes around as well. So I teach electronics at a university in London occasionally. Um, Brexit's put a stop to most of that. But um, I still do teach electronics um, in London to electronics types, um, you know, young undergraduate electronics. Um, but the, the output from the creative side, like kind of the quote-unquote creative kids being taught electronics and the um, electronics kids being taught how to use electronics creatively is completely different. If you give a room full of electronics students um, a bunch of equipment and you're like, okay, cool, so we're going to make a musical instrument, they will always start with, okay, what sensor are we going to use first? Um, and then eventually, like very, very, very close to the end, you know, they build their own designs, they build their code, they're like, yes, it's working, it's amazing. And then they're like, oh, well, we'll just do use a sine wave. And so all my electronics people who make instruments, they're like, they make these nasty sounding instruments with really complicated sensor interfaces that just like, please don't subject my ears to that anymore. But the musicians who make them, who are uh, considerably less talented at knowing what, how to put things on an Arduino, for example, um, they, um, they make really beautiful sounding things first, and then obviously their electronics just basically don't work. So uh, you know, it's like trying to, trying to bridge the gap. And uh, yeah, it's always quite fun to do that. My students call me like, the Mary Poppins that like, turns up and saves them and like kind of holds all the electronics in place while, <laughs> while they play it at their final things. So um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of fun to be able to um, be the bridge between um, electronics and, um, and creativity. Anyway, that's me. Teaching, writing, making things in boxes, and making weird objects that make noises. So, on to the slightly more technical bit. Okay, so... My favorite thing to use, and I've, uh, I'm not paid by them, they've never given me any money, I'm just a total fangirl, like, is Bella and Beaglebone. So most of you are probably, who knows what Beaglebone is? Most of you? Okay, has any of you heard of Bella? No, okay, cool. So Beaglebone, as we know, it's a, like a single board computer, right? It's quite a fancy one, you know, compared to the, um, you know, the Pi or the what a, blah, blah, blah. We, we like the beagle one. We like the beagle one. But the bailer is a cape. Um, aside, I find it extremely cute. That ca it's uh, instead of a hat for a pie, you get a cape for a beagle one. It's like, do, do, do. I like that very much. So anyway, Baylor is a cape, um, and, and it basically turns the beagle bone into an extremely powerful way to make embedded musical instruments. So this is what it looks like. This is, I've got one on my bench. Open up my bag of tricks. There we are. There we are. All right, assorted electronics. This is a 
Bella on top of a pocket beagle. Um, and um, it is a Altoid mini Altoid tin sized um, embedded system. Um, which has been specifically designed, well, the Bella on top of it has been specifically designed to harness the power of the beagle bone and turn it into a way of making music. And I'm going to basically tell you how much I love it for the next half an hour um, and why I love it. So, um, so here we go. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways to make music with different technology systems, okay? This isn't the only one. Um, I've, I've maybe made technology and um, music with almost all of the microcontrollers and single board computers that exist in the world. Um, probably my favorites are Teensy and Bella. Teensy is led by an amazing team um, in Portland and they have incredible audio libraries. Um, Arduino is the classic, you know, um, if everybody makes that, you know, light theremin, which sounds fucking awful. But you know they all do it. They all do it. And then there's the Sonic Pi, which goes on to who's heard of Sonic Pi? Okay, like a couple of you. Okay, so Sonic Pi is really cool. Um, if you're less into the hardware and and if you want to muck around with music, which I hope my talk will inspire you to have a little muck around with music. Um, if you are more a software type person, there's a wonderful um, system called Sonic Pi. That's Sonic Pi. Um, that was developed by a guy called Sam Aaron in Cambridge. Um, and it's like a live coding interface. Who knows what live coding is? Who knows what algo rave is? One person, my husband. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so algo rave is a really cool software-based um, rave culture thing. It's actually quite big in London and Berlin in particular. Um, and it's where nerds like us will stand on stage and we will be live coding away. And But the live coding we're changing are the different beats and the different rhythms and the different instruments. So basically you have your code projected behind you and you are making the music on your laptop in front of you. It is super fun. It's really ravey. It's like really noisy. Look, look it up. Um, it's, it's a great fun thing to, to, uh, to have a go. <laughs> if you're a nerd who also likes a bit of a dance, it's, it's a really, really fun thing to keep uh, your eyes open for. But Sonic Pi is the beginner's version of Algo Rave. Okay, so basically, in, of an evening, if you fancy having a go at being like a, ma a masterful DJ, you can download Sonic Pi. It's free. It's open source, and you can, in one evening, um, learn how to make cool tracks um, using live code. So, would recommend Bella. Not the only one. Bella's just my favorite right now. Um, so, Bella is very special, and I'm going to tell you why. Ah, this is why. Okay, so before I start telling you about all the hardware and software um, in that makes it very, this all very exciting, um, I'm going to show you um, one of my creatures in action that uses one of these. This, this literally just all is powered for. From, let's see if this works. Oh, let's see if the sound works. No, can you turn the sound up? Well, that's rubbish. Turn it up. That's the first creature I ever made. Oh, wow, it's getting a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's based on, um, the sound is based on a harp. Um, and this is a 30-legged creature with 30 individual um, pins um, that work with capacitive touch, which is bonkers. Um, but anyway, I'm going to show you um, what. I'm using here. So that particular one, the tiny, the tiny creature, um, was used uh, was using. So Bella have got on the pocket beagle, and they've also got one on the, you know, the normal one, beagle bone, beagle bone black. Um, so the they're it's basically similar, but they've got slightly more um, analog out um, on the Bella cape. 
on the big one. Um, so let me take, talk you through this a little bit. So as you probably know, then, if you're familiar with the BeagleBone, um, it's got a system on chip, this thing here, system on chip, very powerful. But the cool thing for me is these, these babies. These are the dual microcontrollers that allow me to do lots of really cool things with sound. Uh, and the cape itself um, has got 16-bit audio and analog in out, which is very powerful. Um, and I'm going to tell you what this means in a hot minute. Because to you, you're like, high bandwidth surface processing. You understand what that means, but like, what on earth has that got to do with music? And this jitter-free jitter stuff is super important as well. But let's just uh, move on from that, and I'll come back to it. All right, so here we are. You don't really need this. This is a pin-out diagram. Um, normally, this is where I'd uh, explain the difference between analog and digital and PWM, but I'm pretty sure this audience does not need to know that. <laughs> um, all right, so... Um, but it does have a lot of pins, which is really great for when you're making um, embedded instruments. You can do a lot of things. You know, something with a, the, like a, um, a, a smaller board um, wouldn't have, I mean, if you want 12 pins. So the classic one that a lot of people use is there's a, a, a chip called the MPR121, um, which is a 12, uh, 12 output uh, um, uh, capacitive touch chip. Um, but it's very limited for musicians because, of, co of course, like 12 is not enough. That's like one octave. That's no good. Right. So let's go back to here. We are latency. Great. Okay. So here we are. We know what it is. We know what it. We know what it has. We know what pins it has. But the reason why it's so cool um, for instrument makers is, as I mentioned, for those those microcontrollers. It means that we can do something with latency now. When any, when any blah, 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 words. whenever anybody makes any kind of electronic instrument, um, you're going to have to go into battle with this latency. So latency, you all understand what it means. I don't have to explain what that means. But uh, essentially, it's the lag between the input sensing something and then the thing doing something. In this case, audio out, but it could be any kind. You know, it could be motor, it could be light, whatever. It's it's the lag between doing, you know, like sensing and doing. And in, um, in, uh, in music, this is very, very important. So say, say, this, say this sensor here is, like a, I don't know, a pressure sensor, like a force resistance sensor. And this audio out is like a duck, right? Here you'd be like, wah, that's no good. You want to do wah, that's much better, because you need to be able to create that sound. And this is incredibly important when you're talking about any kind of stringed or percussive instrument. If you hit something and you don't get an immediate response from it, it doesn't feel like an instrument and you've basically failed. So, uh, ba, ba, ba. latency, here we go. So yeah, so long latency means you can hear the difference between you touching the thing or you interacting with whatever thing it is um, and the thing itself sounding. Um, which is okay if you're doing, you know, some kind of modular synthesis that's just all wavy and, and bloopy. Um, but if you're actually trying to have an interactive instrument, a properly played instrument, it's absolutely no good. So y once you start playing with um, embedded instruments, you start, especially if you're using the Raspberry Pi, no good. Like, you can hear it. You can, like, pretend to make a guitar with a Raspberry Pi and you can hear it. You can hear it. Um, anyone, even, even people who aren't uh, trained musicians can hear it. So basically, um, you need to be able to um, get down to a latency, which is around between 1 and 10 milliseconds, which is, you know, kind of a lot. Oh, that wasn't supposed to be. Never mind. Um, and, there's a, and apart from the Bella, now, there's nothing out there that reaches this level of latency in a microcontroller that you can use in a better, which is why mostly you'll see Embedded, you'll be see people plugging things into your la into the laptops um, rather than using embedded systems. So, but the Bella, if you look at this, so PD, which is pure data, which we'll come to in a hot minute, um, has 19 milliseconds, which is absolutely audible. Like you can really hear that. Arduino to Max, Max is another type of software. We'll come to that in a minute. 11 milliseconds, also definitely audible. Bella is 0.5. And if you're talking audio uh, analog in to analog out, you're looking at a latency of 0.1 milliseconds, which is inaudible. We can't recognize that. So when I say that Bella is a game changer in terms of embedded instruments, I really mean it. Like, 
it's very exciting. You can make that duck quack, like, perfectly. Um, <laughs> like, where did that come from? I don't know. Um, all right, so um, just briefly, in an audio loop, these are, um, these are the things you've got to consider. Um, you've got, um, from in, that's the little microphone, you've got the, um, you got from the AGC is in, um, and then you're going to get like some kind of um, jump when it goes to, depending on the bitstream, when it goes to the OS. Um, then you go through to the code, and then you go back out to the US, OS and back through to the deck. So at each of those jumps, you can lose latency. Um, and that's called the like round trip audio latency. And that will always stay the same, okay? So your, your round trip audio latency um, can be measured and it can be predicted. There's another type of latency which is less predictable, which we'll come to in a hot minute. But so that your number one thing you need to do when you're designing an audio system is to make sure that each of those steps you reduce, um, you reduce them at all times. What, what is going on? There we are. I was doing this thing. All right. I forgot I did that. Never mind. Oh no. Oh dear. There we are. There we go. Okay. So this interaction latency. Um, that you've got a sampling. Um, so there's the two things, there's a round trip and then the interaction, okay? So you've got um, the sampling, um, which is how often it um, well, samples, obviously. Um, then you've got the communication in the middle, um, which is like how long it takes to get from the sensor to your computer. Um, then you've got the OS latency, which is a killer. This is why Raspberry Pi is so shit at um, music, um, is because you can't uh, use the type of um, latency, latency reduction that the Bella does, which I'll show you right in a hot second. And yes, here we go, blah, blah, blah. I feel like you've got it. So the way the Bella does this is it uses something called Xenomai, which is a Linux subsystem thing. Um, uh, sorry, I'm not very Linuxy. <laughs> I, <j> <laughs> I, know, I know enough, but... Um, so it uses Xenomai, and um, basically it means, th which means that the audio code is processed at a higher, um, it's a higher priority than anything else. So all of the other OS, you know, the processing, that's going on on the system on chip, um, but the, um, the audio code is always prioritized, um, which means that the, s um, the rain trip latency is massively reduced, because it's got this dedicated, um, dedicated um, high priority way of getting through. Um, yes, again, small buffer sizes. Okay, we want to win that, and I'll show you why. Jitter, jitter, jitter. Oh, why do I do this? Why do I do this to myself? There we are. All right, so jitter is the other type. Do you remember I said we had the rain trip? Okay, so that was uh, the rain trip thing, which was um, uh, like the whole path, um, and that's reduced by using Xenomai, but also jitter. Um, jitter is basically um, like the, the latency between you pressing the thing and it knowing that you pressed the thing. Um, and it m that all that comes down to is um, the sensor data needs to be sampled at a really high rate in order to kind of reduce that and reduce the latency even further. So there, that's all it does. There's the details there, you know, if you care, which you might do. Um, so basically, yeah, it has two main ways of massively reducing latency, which for me as a user is very exciting. It means that I'm able to create what feels like to me real-time audio interactions. Um, so there we go. Bella jitters. That's okay. So yes, the Bella is very fast. Hooray. We know this. Um, the other really cool thing is um, they really thought about who was going to be using that. Um, and one of the um, one of the best things about Bella, f for me as a user, um, is that their software is really um, really friendly to use, um, and it's um, also got a lot of uh, really cool functions, which I'll show you. So basically, quickly, um, it's got a basically when you plug it in, you um, you just go to bella.local, and it'll bring you up a browser um, based IDE. It's got a whole bunch of um, like example projects in there. You've got your project files. You've got your files. You've got like the the little this thing here G gives you like an interactive pinout diagram, which is always really helpful because um, if you're like me and you forget your glasses all the time, you're like, what does that do? 
So um, that's really helpful. And the other cool thing is it's got an oscilloscope, which is really awesome. I always like a browser-based oscilloscope. Who doesn't want one of those? But it's also got loads of good settings on it, right? Look, ooh, look at all those settings. Very cool. All right. Um, so yeah, the IDE is pretty easy to use. Um, and browser-based is really nice for teaching as well because um, most schools don't trust their teachers enough to be able to download um, software. Um, so it, and if you're going to be able, if you want to deploy something in a school, doing a browser-based IDE is the way to go. And in seeing that more and more with, uh, so like Arduino and I doing an, a browser-based IDE, obviously like Circuit Playground Express, Microbit, all of the, um, all of the hardware that's designed to be used in schools, they've all moved to browser-based IDEs, and that's why. Uh, well, one of the reasons why. Um, the other and best thing about the Bella is that you can you can use it with lots of different things. Initially, it was done for C++, um, um, and but then they actually started using it with the musicians, and the musicians were like, "We're not losing. We're we're not going to learn how to use that. That's ridiculous." Um, so they made it work really, really well with two massive um, pieces of music software. This is PD, the middle one is Pure Data, and this is Super Collider up here, and then these are some other ones that I don't know anything about. Um, but Pure Data is a really amazing um, sound synthesis. Um, it's open source. It's an open source sound, sy sound synthesis um, soft piece of software, which I'll show you a little bit of. Um, but it means that people who have already created sound synthesis um, were then able to put it into embedded objects um, and create their own instruments rather than just pressing play on a laptop for a soundscape that they've made, which opens up their sound synthesis to a whole new kind of interactive world. It's pretty exciting. So, Pure Data and Max. This is kind of a fun one. Um, wait, here we are. Um, so, Pure Data and Max. Pure Data. Is, is this one, and Max is this one. This one costs a lot of money, and this one is completely free. Um, people call it, people call Pure Data Budget Max, which is slightly unfair. Um, there's a slightly interesting, so actually they were both developed by the same person, and this guy called Miller Puckett, uh, who's really interesting. Um, he developed Max while he was at MIT, um, and it was also, he was paid to do some of his coding by, oh God, I always forget the name of this, some other acronym. Um, some other acronym then <laughs> owned, uh, said that they owned Max and started charging more and more and more for it. And, uh, and this dude Miller was like, fuck this. So he left um, <laughs> and he basically made Budget Max, so <laughs> which is pure data, which is completely open source. Um, and it works almost the same. And this one's got a nicer GUI on it because they got a huge team and lots of, um, lots of, um, Lots of uh, lots of money, but um, Miller Puckett did his own uh, Budget Max Pure Data, which is rad. Um, and if you're interested in him, and he is actually quite an interesting person, um, there's a lovely four-page paper that he wrote called "Who Owns Our Software: A First-Person Case Study." Lovely, really worth looking that up. Um, really nice, um, just four pages, and and nicely written. It's not like an academic nonsense. It's actually um, his own musings on like why he was pissed off at having to leave Max and then starting Pure Data and like who owns art um, and who owns software. Um, really, really worth um, really worth a little read. Um, anyway, so pure, da pure data, awesome, very, very powerful. So if you're making music in something like an Arduino, you're reliant on libraries, um, which are fine, but they're actually fairly basic. Um, so if you want to do anything actually sonically interesting, you're going to want to be using something like pure data or so super collider. And this is the um, only, actually, no, the Raspberry Pi now runs pure data, but because of the latency issues inherent in P um, Raspberry Pi, it's still like rubbish. Um, sorry, Raspberry Pi. Um, so yeah, that's very exciting. Um, and this is something that I find really cool. Um, so I think this is something that often blows the minds of the people that I work with, um, is uh, in the musicians in particular, that you can interface physical objects with um, sound synthesis in like a really, really simple way. So I'll just explain what's going on here. This is like a simple patch. We've got um, ADC, which is like, is in, and then you've got a three, four. So you've got, here we got the first two analog pins, right? So it's, it's drawing information from the, 
those two pins where it's triggering it essentially. And then what it's doing is it's got like um, it's got frequency, it's got amplitude, and it's got the oscillation, which is essentially what a sound is, right? And then it's going out to DAC one two three. And DAC one two three is analog out and audio out left and right, so the two channels of audio. So that's as simple as it is. You just put in those numbers and you can trigger whatever you want. And then the fun bit comes in the middle. So this is where you would design your sound. But in terms of like adding in GPIO to an existing sound, it really is as simple as one box with those pins, which is really cool. Um, GPIO. Then what you do once you've, uh, once you've made your patch, um, all you do is you save it onto Bella on the IDE. Um, and then as soon as you reboot your Bella, it just works. So that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, that is an overview of Bella and how it works. I'll show you a couple of examples of it. Um, this is an augmented guitar pick made, made using the Pocket Bella. Um, this is actually really cool. Um, it allows you to, uh, while you're playing guitar, add in extra gestures or hand movements to create like um, various different sound effects. So instead of a stomp box, you've got like you can wobble your hand or do whatever. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, this is a collaboration between that's a, a dude from London called um, John Kelly and another dude from London called Gawain Hewitt, Hewitt who works for Drake Music. Um, and they work together um, to make a lot um, uh, augmented instruments that are customized for people with disabilities. Um, so uh, John Kelly designed it and um, helped build it and, um, and Gawain helped do some of the electronics as well. So that kind of like ultra customization of things um, is really something people use a lot for. Um, I included this one. This one's a really interesting version. So this is a this is an instrument that so far, okay, we've got these very individual. This looks like a student project. This is obviously just made for one person. Um, this is a real instrument that has been invented in the last fifty years, um, and is now becoming actually quite popular. Um, I wanted to say <laughs> that all instruments are made up, you know. The, the violin wasn't the violin until the 13th century when we developed the, same, the right tools and techniques to be able to make the violin the violin. You know, electronic um, embedded instruments, you know, some of them will fall by the wayside, but some of them will actually become real things. And this is on its way to becoming a real modern experimental instrument. Um, it's um, it's been used in the um, it's it's it's, um, it's a wonderful sounding instrument. You should look at it on YouTube, um, and it's been used like in Sicario and Arrival and on various TV shows. It's played in concerts all over the world. It's a very famous brand new augmented instrument. Um, but yeah, um, there's no, <laughs> no. If I was giving a talk to an art crowd instead of you, I'd probably go into some John Cage quotes. But yeah, it's very pretentious and annoying. So let's not do that. <laughs> All right, the other cool thing about the Bella team um, is that they have been working with all sorts of different artists. Now this is um, an artist called Mika Satomi, um, who with, together with Hannah Pernier-Wilson um, lead this incredible research lab called Cobacant um, in Berlin. And they experiment with conductive materials. So this is um, these silver things are crocheted um, conductive fibers, um, which are then used. And then these these here um, will connect into the um, to the bella. So um, she made these things. Um, so basically, that's another point I wanted to make is that the reason I really like this team is that they're really trying to meet artists and practitioners where they are. They're not just like here as a board you need to use jumper cables. They're actually producing and experimenting with like official designs that will help um, artists and wearable, um, people who are working in the wearables field to um, actually do this. Um, interesting thing about that, do I have it? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, if you are designing hardware, um, so people who are working in hardware um, are often talking about the idea of wearables, but then producing like these absolutely enormous, terrible things. Um, and, and everybody who makes wearables is like, no, thank you. Um, but there are a couple of cool tricks um, that we've been working on. Um, so these, these are just like some handmade stuff. Um, and this is a, 
let's put this here. Very elegant. This is a, um, a flexible PCB that I made, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I've got loads of cool PCBs, so if you want to have a look at them. Um, but one of the cool things about this is um, it uses um, two rows of pins, um, one of which is for strain relief. So if you're designing a PCB for um, a wearable in purpose, then you should put two rows in so you can put your um, either your thread or your silicone coated wire through both, and then when it moves, it, it won't actually, uh, it won't hurt the joint, the solder joint. It'll just, um, it'll just, um, it'll just um, put, put pressure on the outside one. The other thing you can do when creating PCBs for wearables um, is, uh, you know, what castellated edges are on a PCB. It's like when you've cut, when, like basically, it looks like when you've cut a PCB hole like in half, yeah. Well, if you do two lines of those, like one of them in half, castellated, and then one that actually joins in, it works really, really well for sewing. So you can like sew through, and those those work as anchoring points. Um, there we are. E-textiles tips. I bet you didn't think you'd learn those today. Anyway, so yes. Da da da. Oh yeah, new sensors. I have some new sensors here. These are cool. Um, if you're ever working with capacitive touch in your projects or on your products, these are really exciting new things. So normally when you work with cap touch, it can be like on, off, or proximity. Um, these are a new thing. They've got, um, this is like the square, and you can do like different axes. So is that if you have a close look at it, it's got like this matrix um, of, of sensing holes, essentially, so it can position your finger where it is. And this has not previously been able to, you can, I've done an experiment with this before on kind of like woven fabric, but it's never been very accurate. So this is very exciting. If you're working with cap touch and you want to do, um, you know, separate fingers, pushing, whatever, it's really fun. Um, and then this one, another sensor they're doing is a, um, is the 30 channel. This is one basically that makes the MPR 121 kind of redundant as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I've been building a lot of stuff with this because it's got 30 channels. So that's an enough for a proper, um, and it, it uses ITC as well. So um, you, can, you can stack them, which is pretty cool. Anyway, um, that is, oh, this is one of my things that I made with, the, with the this one. Um, here we go. I wonder if this is going to work. It's a base with two levels of modulation. That one always works better when there's a sub bass woofer in the room, which the West one doesn't have, but never mind. There's an <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so um, those are some creatures and things that I've made with the Bella. There are other cool thing, other cool platforms out there. And if you are working on music type projects or are interested in it, do let me know because I do have lots of advice to give on all sorts of different projects. Um, so that's that's the Bella. But I wanted to quickly um, also show you because uh, some uh, some projects that aren't by me um, because I thought it, you know might be quite fun. Um, and like I think at the moment we're having like a huge um, a resurgence in experimental music technologies, um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but I thought I'd show you some of them. Uh, okay, cool. So um, this is a makerspace. We all know. Do we all know? What we all know what makerspace is. Hackerspace. Yes. Okay. This is my old makerspace in London. Um, and um, there's lots of makerspaces around the world, and lots of them have music technology groups. So there's lots of people who are coming out of these makerspaces and hackerspaces who are interested in making weird sounds. Um, so this has been like a huge, helped a huge resurgence, as well as the um, the availability at these spaces and in general of cheap electronics and cheap sensing materials um, so that you're able to experiment as a hobby without it being um, kind of crazy. Um, the other thing that, so apart from the cheap technologies and the new spaces and the, you know, and the, and the uh, technology, um, the th you know, the, the hacker friendly events like CCC camp uh, or EMF or I don't know if there's a French one. Is there a French CCC camp? No? A Congress? No? 
Why? That's very sad. <laughs> Single tear for you, France. I suppose, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the other core reason for these is, uh, for lots of people doing this stuff, is um, YouTube. YouTube's been huge for music tech. This is a dude called Sam. Um, his YouTube handles look mum, no computer. Um, he's an electronic engineer um, who makes music technologies and explains how he made them. So he does lots of tech breakdowns as well. So there's loads and loads and loads of really awesome tutorials, um, not just for electronics and physical computing, but also for specifically music technologies. Um, this is a still of his video where he hacked, I think, like 35 Furbies into, um, into a pipe organ. So if you're ever want to stop somebody sleeping, I would recommend you show them this video because it is truly horrific. Um, he also, you may, I know, it's, it's really awful. Watch his videos, they're um, terrible. I mean, wonderful. Um, thank you, Sam, I hate it. Um, <laughs> basically. Um, so the, what else? oh yeah, he also did something ugh, crazy cool recently. There's a new Lego advert out where loads of the Lego robotics toys play the Star Wars theme. Have anybody seen that? Mm, well, you should look at it, because it's him making it. He's so cool, so jealous. Anyway, whatever, yeah, Sam, YouTube. There's lots of cool things on YouTube. Um, and <laughs> Um, and also, I feel like there is, in, with the advent of hacking and the advent of makerspaces and the advent of like social media and YouTube, um, non-professionals doing things, I feel like people have been given permission to fuck around with technology and experiment with it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Hardly any of us know what we're doing in, mus in the music hacking scene. We're all just like, hmm. One of my favorite music tech creators, um, uh, Andrew Hockey, who's someone I work with uh, a lot, and he was like, Helen, I can't get my circuit working. So we went to the pub and I turned it over and I was like, what? What are these, what are these things? And he was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> he, tried to, he was soldering it with plumbing solder. So he had the soldering joints were like this fat. And of course, in the middle of plumbing solderer is acid. So I was like, mate, <laughs> please never do this again. You are literally just destroying your circuits as soon as you make it. So we had to resolder every single joint. So basically, none of us know what we're doing, but we're all having a really good time. Um, this is a quote from the BD BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Um, normally, I give a talk about um, Delia Derbyshire and, um, and, um, and Daphne Oram and the advent of this amazing um, workshop, which was uh, a s an amazing place for sound experimentation. Um, actually, very much influenced by Paris's own Musique Concrète. Um, but it was a wonderful age of experimentation and weird noises um, that ended up being incredibly influential. Um, so yeah, I think there's a spirit of, at the moment, there's a spirit of, yeah, let's have a go, let's see what we can do. Let's have a nice time. Um, and also, I think as part of this, there is a whole spirit of collaborations. Um, so what have I got here? Oh yeah, here's just one collaboration, I, just because I want to talk about collaborations. Um, have, like none of the stuff that I do is just made by me. Um, I always work with somebody else um, instead of just doing my own stuff because generally somebody else's thing really, really impresses me and then what I do really impresses them and then we smush our talents together and we actually make something pretty cool. So. This is Martine Nicola Rogina, and she's known as Sister Moon, um, and her literal job is that she takes sound recordings from all over the world, and she bounces them off the moon via a satellite in the Netherlands. And then she re-records the sounds of those um, things as they come back, and it, they are all kind of like distorted and gnarly, and it's all very rad. Um, so, so I, I saw um, her do a talk, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. I really want to bounce some sounds off the moon. Can I bounce some sounds off the moon? She was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so we ended up bouncing. She, um, she got me some, some, some signs of a cello that she'd bounced off the moon, that the sound. She bounced. Off, she didn't bounce the actual cello off the moon. Um, and then we did. <laughs> we, we put it into this. Um, so <laughs> um, this is a leather robot unicorn. Um, briefly, I made a, a couple of, maybe a couple of years back, I made a herd of robot unicorns that you controlled with gesture. Um, but we won't go into that. Um, we're going to talk about the glove. <laughs> so the glove was, so the reason it's leather um, is because someone who th who's a leather artist, she makes beautiful leather gloves, um, for like queens and shit, um, 
<laughs> she like, she's very fancy. Um, she was like, can I make a leather robot unicorn? I was like, yeah, sure. She, so she made, she made me this gesture control glove, which is like this elbow length black leather glove. It makes me feel like really evil. It's great. Um, but I can gesture control my herd of robot unicorns um, with this elbow length leather glove, um, which got me some pretty interesting DMs on Twitter. But <laughs> like, let's not dwell on that. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> ooh. Um, so ignore the unicorn. Um, but <laughs> we just took the glove, and then basically, um, we, uh, me, and this, this, the, the moon girl. Uh, we made um, a synthesizer so I could gesture control the sound of the cello that was bounced off of the moon. And, and my point, f apart from just to tell you kind of how ridiculous a human being I am, my point is telling you this story is um, you can do all sorts, you can do something much more exciting and much more technically, you know, if, if you combine, if you, if you join powers like the Transformers, you know. The Transformers. Okay, good. Um, and then my final thing, I think, um, is to tell you about my next door neighbour, <laughs> right? Um, so I live in Berlin now. I've run away from, I, you can tell by my accent, I'm not from Berlin. I'm from Wales, um, but I've run away from Brexit. Um, so I live in Berlin now, and I live next door to this dude, Johannes Lobuleur. And he makes, I mean, how German does this look? It's great. Um, he makes these robotic sound machines called Dada machines, and they're like uh, MIDI, this is the controller here. Um, they're like uh, MIDI, solenoid, they're MIDI solenoid controllers, um, make robotic noise. Let me just see if I can do this, actually. All right, there we go. That's a, a nice gift for you. So it does that kind of thing, right? Um, but the reason why I wanted to show you this is because we've been having this conversation about open source a lot recently. Um, as um, hackers and as artists, we share everything. Like, we share everything. Like, if someone messages me and is like, how do you do this? I'm like, well, how long do you have? Because <laughs> nobody ever asks us how we make up weird stuff. So basically, we're always really excited to share things. So I'd say that's the, that's the spirit of open source, right? Um, but, yeah, we share everything, but we don't really open source things in the way that you'd describe as open source. Like, all of the people, of all of the people I just showed you, every single person, uh, me and Johannes are the only ones who even have a GitHub. Like, and my GitHub is real shit. Like, it's just a random collection of things. When people ask me to share something, I will put some stuff on there, but it's not something I habitually do, you know? So it's not, it's open source in spirit, but it's not actually open source. We don't have the documentation up there because, you know, we're, uh, you know, documentation is hard to do properly. None of us are getting paid to do this, you know? We don't have jobs. <laughs> you know, we're layabouts. <laughs> so why we live in Berlin? You know, um, we, I, we do actually do work, but like, you know, it's, we don't get paid to do the documentation. We don't get paid to, to like, you know, properly comment our code or anything. We're just like, ooh, can we make this work? And then a lot of us, because we're part-time hackers, we're all really shy about putting our code online. Like, we're all mostly self-taught, and we're just like, oh my god, this is terrible. Everyone's going to look at this and be like, get off the stage. So, I mean, I think there is, so there's that, there's the insecurity, there's the um, inability, you know, the, the lack of time. Um, and also, with this one in particular, um, this, this thing, um, so Johannes is, Johannes is uh, a bit better. He's putting all of his code um, online. Um, as open source, um, he's put his schematics online um, and his bill of materials, but he's not sharing his um, his layouts. Okay, his layout, which we, which you need to share your layouts, your schematics, and your bill of materials, and have everything available. That's why Raspberry Pi isn't um, open source, um, and have everything available in order for it to be open source hardware. But he's not putting his layouts online, and this is and it's not because we don't want to share. Like we would share our layouts with anybody if they asked. But we know, I mean, so for example, here is a small group. Here's a small um, open source, uh, was open source, I think. Um, um, a small open source board called Bear Conductive. Um, they're a small group of um, artists who make, do really cool things. Um, and it was open source, and it being open source for them has kind of fucked them a bit. Like, there's so many Chinese knockoffs of what they do. And, w and like hardware, like, you can't compete on price. You know, if you put your layers online, you know, you're basically, then everybody's gonna just not buy your stuff. I'm, I'm not saying, like, that's how we believe it should be, but I'm just saying that there's a lot of people, small, 
small people with like one or two two people who are doing their layers like we're troubled about open source we're like we want to do it but we're th also this is our livelihood and we're really scared to put it out there and i find like a lot of people who are like talking uh, talking about open source like from from the uh, from the perspective of having a stable job um, and from the perspective of being paid to do open source code you know it's very different when it's your own little baby and you're only just making rent every month you know i think it's um, we want to do open source stuff, but I'm just, you know, all, all of my stuff I put up is open source. Um, but I also understand why people don't as well. So uh, I think that's an interesting discussion for the pub. Like, how can we, how can we, can we, sh how can we like make sure that other people can use our designs, but also not get ripped off, you know? Or, or is that just it, you know? Um, you know, is is it a open source by request? I don't know. Anyway, whatever. I'm happy to talk about that after. Um, that's it, isn't it? Hang on, wait. Do I have... How, how long did I talk for? Time, all right. Okay, well, let's let's skip past Ariana Grande then. Shh. And my meme... My meme and look, there's my... Ooh. That's not open source, but it's cool. But there we are. Last slide. The end. <laughs> It's very hot up here. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes. <laughs> uh, first comment. Uh, you're about what you said about open source, I'm talking about more from your the software side of things, mm. where you said you don't have the documentation up or something. It's not truly open source because you haven't done everything. Uh, some people are kind of nervous about the code. Do you realize that's where open source basically started from? People who were had stuff that they really didn't know what they were doing sending stuff up. This is back, you know, mm. late 80s, early 90s. It's uh, even Linus said, you know, you know, you know, quoting Linus, he said, this is not like, you know, GNU Herd or anything like that. This is going to be like, no one's going to want to use this thing. It'll never become, it'll never be uh, ported on any other thing other than the i386. <laughs> this is what Linus said when he posted open source. So yeah. don't be afraid to post things. It's a community. People, you learn when you share, uh, get past your insecurities and yeah. share um, that and I'm about trying to yeah and <laughs> also you know one thing as I, I feel for you when you talk about open source hard when you talk about open source hardware or uh, that's a different thing yeah. software is basically you just type and anyone goes hardware you have to manufacture and get yeah. fabs and when you're competing you're right with something like China that could get yeah. those fabric you know much much cheaper there's a cost difference there yeah. So I, I understand the yeah. problems there. I mean, particularly when, I mean, so for example, Johannes, um, I've actually got the, the prototype of our, uh, we're doing a collaboration. Uh, Johannes and I are doing a mini Dada machines. Um, so like a little um, y um, mini solenoid um, actuator thing. Um, and we manufacture um, and assemble in Germany, um, you know, for climate reasons, for quality reasons, for ethical reasons. You know, we w we manufacture in unionized factories. Um, and we can't compete on price in any way, you know, a and let alone, you know, be able to earn a living, you know? So kind of like this, this kind of, I call it like boutique hardware, I guess, you know? It's, we're not mass, man we're never gonna sell like 200,000 units. We're probably gonna sell like 2,000, you know? It's, it's hard. And, and a question I have that kind of was answered on Twitter already was, you used, uh, they said they used ZenMI on the one uh, thing. I'm wondering is why not preempt RT? Not, is ZenMI is, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, a, half a, a half a millisecond is a long time. <laughs> and we're talking, we could do 20 microseconds, so. Have I missed, if I missed a Twitter joke while well, I've been up here? No, it's not a Twitter joke. <laughs> I, I'm one of the real-time maintainers for the preempt RT kernel, which is oh, a competitor of oh, Xenomai. Okay. <laughs> so I'm actually very happy you are using Xenomai. Just stick to it. <laughs> fight, 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 fight. We're going to have a fun pub tight. <laughs> uh, oh, does anyone else want to ask me a question? Yeah. No. It's not. It's I not. Not a question, it's a comment. Denied. Oh. <laughs> so there is actually an audio library called uh, EVL, I believe. It's kind of newish. You might want to look into it. It's uh, low latency. I, I believe it's EVL. It's kind of spawned out of Xenomai, so it might be interesting as well to look into that. Thank you.
All right, questions over. Let's go to the bar. <laughs> if anyone wants to see my flex PCBs, you can. They're really fun. Oh, I brought a tentacle too. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> All right, well, there we are. <laughs>